Okay, welcome committee, welcome everybody, and uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on Economic Development and Environment. Uh, today we have a public presentation from Lutoke Dene First Nation on the proposed Tai Dene Nene National Park Reserve. And with us we have Mr. Stephen Nita and Mr. Larry Eines. Thank you for being here. Uh, Innes. Innes. Innes, okay. My apologies. Um, before we get started, uh, for the record, of course, as we always do, I will get committee to introduce themselves and I'll start at my far right. I'm RJ Simpson, the MLA for Hay River North. Uh, thank you for coming. I've been looking forward to this presentation for a while. Uh, Kevin O'Reilly, Frame Lake. Good morning, Danny McNeely, Santu Region. Karen Hester, Cam Lake. Good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, Tom Bowley, MLA for Tuneda Willoughby. Uh, good morning and welcome, uh, Herb Nakamak from <coughs> the Nakamak. My name is Corey Van Thine, MLA for Yellowknife North. Welcome, thank you for being here. We also have from our research department, uh, Mr. Gustavo Oliveira, and from our clerk's office, Ms. Gail Bennett. And um, just a couple housekeeping items before we get started. One is, uh, for those who might not be familiar, certainly uh, Mr. Nita, former MLA, is familiar with this room. Um, we exchange the conversation through the chair. You won't have to touch your mics in any way. Our technician, uh, Indio, will do that uh, as the conversation ex exchanges through the chair. Um, the other thing that I would like to do is let you know that sitting and uh, observing today, we have a number of uh, legislative interns from the Manitoba Legislature. And so if I can, maybe we'll take a moment and I would like them to introduce themselves. If we'll start over here on the far left. Uh, Chris Kamite, uh, Claire Johnson, I'm working with the Manitoba Local All right, thank you all. We had them here with us today. They've been here with us all week observing uh, how consensus government uh, unfolds. So it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, also, just so you know, uh, the PowerPoint today, whoever's gonna end up putting on the presentation, um, are you sharing or will it be uh, uh, Mr. Innes? We'll go back. We'll go back and forth, okay. Again, just when appropriate, uh, exchange through that through the chair, but it, when you need a slide uh, changed, um, Ms. Bennett can uh, do that for us, so just uh, let us know when you want to, and we'll just say next slide and we can move forward. So without further ado, um, Mr. Nita, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the members of the Legislative Assembly today, thank uh, the committee, <coughs> On behalf of uh, Chief Marlowe and, uh, and the Lutzika Dene First Nation Chief and Council uh, for giving us the time this morning to present the Fight in the story. Uh, for those uh, interns that are in the room, you'll find a little bit of uh, uh, PC liberals and, uh, and, uh, and uh, NDP influences in the, in the creation of Fight in the As you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, we've been working on Fight in the for a number of years now. As uh, I've been the community lead on on behalf of Lusaga on Tidy and Yenna since 2010 when we started negotiations with Canada. Uh, the area of interest of a, as a protected area has been an area of interest for 40 plus years, 50 plus years almost now uh, by Canada and we are very close to uh, finalizing and creating uh, a national park reserve on the territorial protected area in a partnership between three levels of governments, federal, territorial, and indigenous governments. What we're presenting here today is a, give, is a snapshot of where we're at and uh, some of the challenges that we still face before we finalize the, uh, uh, the agreements and, and get the legislation uh, enacted here in Northwest Territories and the legislation uh, in the federal system. With me today is uh, Larry Ennis. Uh, Larry is our legal representative on, on our team. 
I'm missing Stephen Ellis, who's also a member of our team. We've been working with Lucid Guide Dinner First Nations from day one, and we've um, had the privilege of working with uh, Parks Canada and the Government of Northwest Territories. We have an agreement in principle initialed with Canada, Parks Canada. Uh, we reinitialed uh, uh, that agreement with, uh, with Parks Canada a couple of months ago. But uh, we'll go through the timelines of Flight and Nene and, and the challenges that's facing us that uh, we are asking the committee and the government of Northwest Territories to work with us in, in finalizing uh, the Flight and Nene through addressing these challenges. The, the first slide, we use this slide in every presentation. This is our beginning slide. This slide has been right across the country from Vancouver to Halifax. This slide's been to the other side of the world, to Australia. All these places Slusa uh, has, uh, has traveled to to make the business case for Thay uh, Dene So this is a slide that's well traveled. The slide was taken back in the 80s, and it's a, it's a photograph of the late elder Liza Anzo bringing youth of the community, and these youth now are our parents and leaders of our community now. It's uh, paying respects to the water of Great Slave Lake. This photograph was taken right at the mouth of the Lockhart River, at the very east end of the Great Slave Lake. This is after our, our week-long pilgrimage that we do annually to pay respect to the old lady in the falls and people who wanted to leave for for back for this again. And as you can see, the water is quite rough and uh, through our belief system, we have a relationship with the lake, as we do with the land and all the all that exists on, on that land. It's p g paying respects to the water, asking the waters to uh, calm down so that people can leave in their boats to get back to Chutzuge. Uh Shortly after this ceremony, the water did calm down and, uh, and uh, the people of Chutzuge were able to return in their boats to the community. Next slide, please. Here's a give, uh, give you a brief, brief snapshot of uh, uh, the work we've been doing since 2000. Uh, as the committee may know, Tlusege uh, and Akechu had reached a framework agreement in, and, and signed off on that framework agreement with Canada and the government of Northwest Territories on July 25, 2000. Shortly thereafter, the elders of the community of Lusage engaged their, their young people to start looking at uh, protected area legislations and practices, not only in Canada but globally, to, to determine best practices. Uh, I think the elders in the community at that time recognized that we've entered into a lands and resources and governance discussions under the Comprehensive Plans Policy. Uh, if you look at the uh, Slusage and where we're situated in the Northwest Territories, we're the most easterly community in the Northwest Territories. There is not another community east of us until you had Baker Lake and Nunavut. And to the south of us is Fort Smith. To the north of us is Copper Mine. To the east of us is Yellowknife Fort Rez. So we're out there in a, in a, in a big territory. And we say our territory is around 200,000 square kilometers, and we use a, a big, all of, all of that area. So to, uh, to go through a, a land and resources and governance negotiations process to, fin to finalize an agreement that will see a quantum of land roughly the size of 10 to 15,000 square kilometers in an area of 200,000, that would be uh, a hard pill to swallow. The elders recognized that, and the land arrangements under a comprehensive claims process would not give us, give, us, give us the tools to manage the lands the way we wanted to manage it, hence uh, looked at the protected areas. So after two years of research on best practices globally, all that information was brought back to the community. Uh, met with the elders over several weeks of discussions. 
through those discussions, the elders in the community uh, focused in on Parks Canada as a partner uh, for several reasons. Uh, the most important reason is that Tlisida has a treaty with Canada, Treaty of 1900. You would know it as Treaty 8 that we made with, uh, the Brit with Canada on behalf of the Queen on July 25th, 1900. Hence, uh, the 2000 uh, framework agreement was on July 25th, 2000. That's one reason. Second reason, the size of the area that they wanted to protect uh, required legislation that industry and others would understand and respect, Parks Canada. Thirdly, uh, we wanted to create a conservation economy uh, through this protected area where we could create an economy that's localized and for the long term. Uh, not as a replacement to the mining industry, but as a complementary to the mining industry. Right now, uh, we're so dependent on the world economy that's cyclical in nature, especially in the mining industry, uh, where if, uh, if, that, if diamonds were, were, market, were control in the marketplace uh, through the stock exchange, uh, we would not have the stability we do now. Unlike gold, diamond is controlled uh, uh, by, the, uh, by the producers. To counteract that cyclical dependency on mineral industry, the community wanted to create a conservation economy. Parks Canada is one of the better marketers of locations in, to attract uh, global travelers two areas. So those are the three main reasons why Parks Canada was selected as a partner. By, by articulating what I just did, I wanted to demonstrate that Lucide has been taking the lead from day one. Never has uh, Parks Canada come to Lucide and say they wanted to create a national park reserve. It was Lucide that went to Parks Canada. At that time, we invited the government of Northwest Territories to the table as well to, to, uh, to create a trilateral, tri party uh, table to negotiate uh, an establishment agreement for Thai Dinh Dinh. The GWT, uh, this was in 2010 when we started negotiations. The GWT at that time was in uh, the final stages of the devolution agreement, so we decided not to participate. Uh, and they sat on the sidelines while Tlisiga and Parks Canada negotiated an, an agreement in principle that we initialed off in the fall of 2013. And then we waited for the GWT. Uh, GWT got their devolution agreement and in 2015 came to the table uh, and we started uh, working with the GWT in creating Thay uh, in partnership with them as well. To date, we have, uh, we have a pretty close matching agreements. We have agreement in principle with Canada. The agreement that we're developing with the GNWT can be married with that, that that we have with Canada. We did that for a purpose. The uh, Schlussige has got to work with both Canada and the government of Northwest Territories and the management and operations of Thaiden and Yenne. We wanted the two agreement, establishing agreements as linked as possible for, for care and easy management uh, regime for Tlisaga. There are obviously going to be some differences. Uh, there are two governments, but we're, we're, uh, we've managed to improve uh, the establishment agreement that we initialed off with Canada based on our discussions with the GWT. And to date, I think we have a pretty good uh, relationship uh, agreements that can guide our how we're going to work together going into the future in the management operations of Thaidin and Yenna where, we're, where ecological integrity and, and cultural continuity will be, will be the backbone and, uh, and obviously creating a, a conservation economy around that. So if you look at the slide, that gives you a, a good idea uh, the, t the timeline, the history and where we're at now. The community of Lusage is, uh, is 
preparing itself to make its decision on December 10th of this year where they'll be uh, voting on the establishment agreements and on the uh, and on the uh, trust agreement those three agreements plus an understanding of the uh, land transfer agreement that's been negotiated and finalized between Canada Parks Canada and the government of Northwest Territories so those th four <coughs> agreements is their understanding of those four agreements is what the members of this day will vote on Unlike other establishing agreements, the vote by the members of this day will be the uh, decision making. Uh, in the framework agreement that we negotiated with Parks Canada and with the GWT, it states there that if this says yes, that's a yes. If this says no, it's a no. No more moving forward in the creation of a uh, protected area. The decision lies with the members, not the chief and council, not the negotiating team. It's the members that make the final decision. And we're in that in a position now where we're comfortable in asking our members to learn about the agreement so that they could make an informed decision. Next slide, please. So this is what uh, it looks like, ladies and gentlemen. This is uh, the final product that we've been working on developing. 26,308 square kilometers of land. The dark core, the dark area of the green is the, uh, would be the Thaitinanina National Park Reserve. The light green would be in partnership with the government of Northwest Territories for Thaitinanina Territorial Protected Area. And the aqua greenish color on the top will be in a relationship with uh, the government of Northwest Territories using the Wildlife Act. So this is the latest and greatest, uh, would be the latest and greatest uh, uh, protected area in Canada. The uh, type of relationship we've been able to negotiate is one of the most progressive uh, relationship building exercises in Canada that that's recognizes uh, Indigenous jurisdictions and authority and uh, roles and responsibilities are spelled out clearly. The way we view it from Tlusige is that this is what was the spirit and intent of the Treaty of 1900 that we agreed to, to where we agreed to share the lands, the, res the responsibility for the management and operations of them, and to benefit from them with our treaty partners, the Canadian public. Next slide, please. So here are the summary details of the uh, I guess it's uh, 26,376 square kilometers. <coughs> Get that big, uh, a few hundred kilometers becomes schematic. All of that site in Indiana is subject to treaty and Aboriginal rights and any land claims, litigation, or treaty provisions that, is, exist, that exist today or could exist tomorrow. It's also... Uh, Saitinanyana is also designed as a side table to the Keitu Lands and Resources Agreement. At the end of the day, the Keitu final agreement will dictate uh, some of these uh, real will change some of these uh, agreements. And that the, uh, the Keitu agreement is the only final agreement that can make some major changes to the establishment agreements. This is uh, a good thing for us in Tlusaga. We're able to take sight in an end for a test drive and make changes through the Acacia final agreement if changes are needed. Uh, it hasn't been done like this in the past, so this is a good thing for us. Non-Indigenous residents and visitors will be able to use Taijin and Nene substantially as they do now. 
exception is big game hunting in the National Park Reserve. And one of the things that Thaidam and Nina has done for uh, the National Park area is that is based on one of Tlusiga Dinner law. We have a law in Tlusiga that states that if you come into our territory, you got to be able to defeat yourself and defend yourself. Because of that law, non-indigenous, -indi non non-section 35 rights holders can bring their dogs and their rifles into Thaidam and Nina and be able to use their rifles to feed themselves and defend themselves. That reality is going to, is, we'll, we'll, we'll have to amend the National Parks Act. So when I say we use, we'll be using Crown laws, both federal and territorial, and inclusive Dinner laws, and Okecha laws in Thaidam and Nina, that's an example of one. And it'll be all three laws we use to create, govern, operate, and manage the Dina Dina together. Next slide. So, no industrial development is allowed in the Dina Dina. There may be small scale industrial development for the use of the community, like one of the river. Uh, artisanal quarries, etc., etc., quarries for roads and infrastructure. Managing operations of uh, of uh, and is the responsibility that's going to be shared with all three levels of government. Initial direct employment in Slutsky resulting from Thaidin and Nina will be 18 positions, including at least eight full time positions. A visitor heritage and operations center will be built in Tlitsuge. And these numbers are just the beginning numbers. These are the early stages. As things wrap up over the, over the years, those numbers will increase. Next slide, please. Parks Canada commits to $32 million in spend on Thaidin and Nene during the first 12 years and $3 million annually after that. So this is a significant funding that's coming in from into the Northwest Territories, into the, this region of the Northwest Territories that doesn't exist now. In addition, Parks Canada will make capital contributions of $15 million to a Thaidin and Nina Trust. We've already established a trust in Tlisoge and we've already have commitments of $15 million from <coughs> philanthropic uh, donors that Canada's matching. This is a different model here again. Uh, the Thaidin and Nina Trust will be owned by the Tlusiga Dina First Nations. Tlusiga can add to that trust over the years, but the 30 million trusts uh, based on a, a conservative return on, of investment, we're looking at 1.1 1 .1 to 1 1.5 million annually Tlusiga will use that money to fulfill our end of the responsibility in, in uh, manage, governing, managing, and operating Thaidin and Nene. Unlike other arrangements where Parks Canada will transfer dollars to the First Nations annually, what we ask Parks Canada is to just give us this one-time uh, contribution in 27 years, this is what we, our math tells us, in 27 years, the taxpayers of this country are no longer on the hook for Tlusiga to participate in the operations management of Thaidin and Nina. The mortgage would have been paid off already. Whereas the, the type of models that exist today, the taxpayers are on the hook in perpetuity. This also gives us a, Tlusiga the freedom and comfort of knowing that they're not dependent on Crown governments annually for financial assistance to fulfill our end of responsibility gives us a, the comfort that we're going to operate as a true partner, uh, Indigenous government partner in the creation, management, and operations of Thaidin and Nene. We're ready for uh, the, the money to go into the trust. We've already created the trust as part of the work, as part of the negotiations process we've created. 
if uh, we had the money today, uh, we would have had a little bit more than 1.5 million in revenues. For those years that uh, the global economy doesn't do well and the trust doesn't do well, Canada has committed to um, paying for at least this operational costs, the minimum operational costs in that year, above the revenues that's required. That's that above the revenue that we get that may not be enough from the trust. And GWT uh, is learning about uh, the business of getting into large-scale protected areas and the management of them. Uh, as you know, the government of Northwest Territories' experience to date has been roadside parks and not, not territorial parks per se. So this is a learning curve for the, that we're going, we're sharing together. What they've committed to so far is 290,000 per year for three years. So that's where we're at with the GWT in terms of uh, their capital investment. But at the, you know, at the same time, uh, we we see value in other uh, contributions that they're making right now. Their work, the ITI is working with the community and work in, and members of the community in preparing them to take on uh, tourism opportunities. That's going to result from the creation of Thai Jinanjana. So that type of work, uh, we see value in that, and we encourage the government of Northwest Territories and you guys to 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 continue pushing them and in doing that investment. Next slide, please. So these are the, some of the critical paths to establishment that we see. As, as uh, I indicated, Klusige is working on finalizing the establishment agreement with, uh, with the government of Northwest Territories and then voting on the establishment agreements and understanding of the, uh, the LTA. Uh, we are hoping to have all that done by the January of 2019. The federal government uh, needs to finalize their LTA agreement negotiations with the GWT, make sure that uh, the, the LTA is uh, representative of the, uh, the spirit and intent with which uh, we are, they are entering into a partnership with both Lusaga and the government of Northwest Territories, and, uh, and make room for Thaigin and Nene in the Federal Act. And this is where the GWT comes in next. You guys, the Government of Northwest Territories has committed to creating a legal instrument by now, or having a legal instrument introduced by now. Uh, the legal instrument that will create the territorial protected area. We are very disappointed that the, the legislation has not been introduced during this assembly. We are quite concerned that the, uh, the GWT may not be able to create legislation during the life of this assembly. The mandate that I have and my team has is to finalize Thaigin and Yen in its entirety which includes the territorial protected area. If that doesn't happen, if the government of Northwest Territories doesn't create legislation to create Thaigyan and Nene, all the good work that's been done by my team, by your negotiating team, by Canada, and by Tlusagea is in jeopardy. What's in jeopardy is a model of an agreement that can be used by Canada, by, Can by the government of Northwest Territories as an example of what reconciliation looks like in this country when, they're when we're talking nation to nation, government to government relationships and in a spirit of reconciliation. We believe Thaigin and Nene is the most progressive, modern lands and relationship agreements that articulates roles and responsibilities by three levels of government, where jobs and long-term prosperity is going to be created, that helps meet Canada's international commitment under the Aichi Accord, that diversifies the economy in the Northwest Territories that this government has is having a hell of a hard time in creating a diversified economy. 
all hinges on the, the territorial legislation now. An investment of millions of dollars in the Northwest Territories would be lost. So we asked the committee to be aware of that, to be cognizant of your roles and responsibilities in ushering the proposed legislation once introduced through the House, through the public consultation, and get it finalized and introduced. The way that legislation has been developed is very progressive legislation. I've, I've been working with, with folks across the country in the last couple of years on protected areas, indigenous protected areas, to help Canada meet its international commitments. How the government is working with Indigenous governments in the Northwest Territories in developing the proposed legislation is something that other jurisdictions is keeping a close eye on right across the country. Indigenous governments, other provincial governments are watching what we're doing here. They're looking for examples to follow. If Canada is going to meet its international commitments under the AG Accord by 2020, they need to protect 17% of the country. They're at 10.6% now. The other 6.4% represents a quantum of land the size of Saskatchewan. They need tools, and they need ex good examples of how they could, that could be done. And their eyes are on you guys, on what type of tools we're creating, and how we're creating protected areas here in partnerships with Indigenous governments. Not to put pressure on you guys, but there's a lot of people watching you guys. And there's lots riding on that legislation. Mr. Ennis. All good. Thank you. Covered it. All right. I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nita. And uh, thank you for your presentation today. Uh, thank you for your words. Uh, thank you for coming in and sharing this information. It is um, long overdue for our collective uh, uh, bodies to get together and have a conversation. And um, also thank you for sharing uh, your concerns. They're, they're very valuable and uh, will uh, weigh heavy on us as we, as we do move forward in the process. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to committee to share... Uh, for comments, questions, or concerns. First, I have Mr. Testar. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to Mr. Nita for his uh, presentation. Um, you know, it's no, it was an intentional choice when we took our seats in this assembly to, to change the name of this committee to Economic Development and Environment, uh, because, you know, gone are the days when the two were in separate columns, and you had your environmental stuff over here and your economic stuff over here. And I think this is a model where we can bring um, the economy and the environment together in a really strong and cohesive vision for how to move forward. And uh, I can't put into words what you have said about the importance of to reconciliation. Um, and that, that strikes a chord with me because, of course, we every northerner understands the, the frustration with prolonged land rights agreements and prolonged land rights negotiations. And if this is a way to move us forward, then I, it's it's no problem to support it. And I have never really taken issue with Titan and NA. My issue is more with, or I have questions about some of the details and why some decisions were made. And I will ask those now. Um, so one thing that's always struck me is the GNWT was not involved in this discussion until 20, 2015. Uh, and the early, the early stages was very much a nation to nation crown relationship with the federal government. And now we have um, brought the GNWT in, in play, and we have the, uh, the territorial park authority ringing the edges of the Federal National Reserve. And there's going to be different rules and different administration. Um, so you have, as your presentation said, big game hunting is not allowed in the, the Federal Reserve, um, but it potentially could be in the territorial reserve. And for me, that seems very confusing for, for people who might be visiting the park if they have access to certain behaviors on one side and then they cross a line that probably isn't going to be a big demarked line in the park itself. 
Um, so I guess the fundamental question is why is this, why was the approach to, to create a tripartite park and not just have a national park reserve with significant indigenous oversight and uh, engagement in the governance of the, the national park reserve? Like why is the territorial government involved, uh, and in particular because they didn't have legislation at the time they got involved? Thank you. Thank you. To that, Mr. Nita. Oh, thank you for that question. As I indicated uh, from the onset when we started the negotiations in 2010, we did invite the government of Northwest Territories to, to, to participate as a party. Uh, they didn't. They were concentrating on the devolution agreement. When they did uh, agree to, to join us at the table in 2015, their mandate was to reduce the size of Thaiji Nana to the original withdrawal of the 1970s. Uh, and make that a federal park reserve only. Uh, through good relationships and, uh, and we convinced the government of Northwest Territories that it's, a, it's good business to get into the conservation business and the conservation economy. So, you know, uh, we reduced the size of Flagon and Yenit by 7,000 instead of 7,000. And we've created a territorial protected area where the government of Northwest Territories can learn the business of conservation and the conservation economy. Uh, my mandate is to protect as much of the 33,000 square kilometers as we can. So I'll leave the answers vague like that. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart? Uh, do you, uh, thank you. Um, and, and that. That's a much more honest answer than I've heard to date from, from some of our government officials. So I appreciate your insight into the process that, that we're now at at this point in history. Um, so the, most recently we've seen proposals that the GNWT uh, through the minister is interested in creating space for infrastructure corridors through the territorial portions of the park. Um, given your commitment to preserve as much of the land as possible, how do you feel about that? Because it would appear that infrastructure can be very disruptive to the natural environment, especially if it's uh, a transportation corridor. So are there any concerns that, that that policy move might not be in the best interests of the conservation economy? Thank you. Thank you. To that, Mr. Nita. Yeah, there's, there's been uh, expression of interest in the corridor in both, uh, in both if, we go, if we go to the, uh, the map, uh, portion of the presentation. There's there's interest in a, in a corridor, uh, both in expressed by the government of this territories. And his position is that sure we we could see a need for a corridor uh, on McLeod Bay North uh, if uh, if if there's ever going to be any development outside of fighting and any there. Uh, we agree to a corridor there, and if there's going to be a corridor to the south and southeast, we 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 feel that the corridor should go through the territorial protected area, leaving from Tlutsege. We already have a road that's 30 kilometers or so, uh, airport, uh, human resource base right there. So, any corridors uh, that's going to require that's going to be required to go through the to fight the Nene should go through the territorial protected area, and that's. Something that we uh, we could uh, we agreed to that we could live with. Thank you. Further, Mr. Testart. Uh, thank you, and thank you for that clarification. Um, so, uh, just I'll end on, on just a, a note that uh, I take your, your comments about the the lack of uh, the delays in legislation quite seriously. Um, we are in the business of, this committee is in the business of reviewing legislation, not developing it. And uh, we work with government when they bring forward proposals and provide commentary. But uh, I personally agree that it's been three years and we have not seen a bill hit the floor um, that, that deals with this, with, with protected areas. And this was part of the, um, the, the why the, the or part of the vision the premier laid out of completing the devolution agreement, completing the the devolution agenda, if you will, and bringing <coughs> new legislation in place to do all the things that we want for our residents and and for our um, First Nations partners as well. So I completely agree there. And I mean, I th if, if there are other options like a Tide Act. 
that could later be brought into the protected area strategy that just deals with the park, that's something that could be considered as well. So I think there are legislative options out there. And if it does appear that um, there's no chance of getting it passed by to meet your timelines, I think there are other options that can be developed uh, rather than just cutting the GNWT out and going directly with Canada. So um, we, I look forward to either seeing a Protected Areas Act or to developing those strategies and, uh, and hearing your thoughts on, on, uh, on this project as we go forward. But I, I do support um, this, uh, this, this park project for all the reasons you stated. And that conservation economy is something I'm very interested in. So thank you for coming today. Thank you, Mr. Tesslart. Take that as a comment. Points taken. Next I have Mr. Nakamayak. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for the presentation. Um, looking at this, you know, I, I come from a, an area in my region where we have a national park. Um, we, we, uh, and being, you know, I worked in the Warden Service geez, 15 years ago, and so many changes have been made within Parks Canada uh, legislation um, from, you know, the 2000s till now. Um, sometimes it's hard to understand the changes and, and why they why they are the way they are. Um, you know, we negotiated a marine protected area. We negotiated a high seas fisheries agreement. Um, you know, and, and for Canada and, and the territory itself um, to to be as slow as they are. You know, I, I'm I'm wondering as you're presenting and talking and listening to you deeply, what are the what other angles could be taken to, you know, to take this to the level where it's going to actually um, get the GNW to, to sit down and listen and look and work hard towards developing this. Um, maybe it, it might. You know, you may have to go back to the negotiation tables and make a team, you know, uh, of, of three or four different entities uh, to develop this so that, so that we don't lose track. We're going into this election year coming up, and, you know, hopefully this doesn't lose traction during that time. Um, I'm just wondering if um, Mr. Nita or, or Mr. Innes can, can reflect on some of the angles that they've taken where we might be able to help as a committee, as a government, to, to, to kind of give it the push it's needed to, to go where it needs to go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'll go to Mr. Innes. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Mr. Nekmak, for the uh, for the question. I think it's a uh, it's important for us to note just how far we've come in a short period of time with the GNWT. As we indicated, they were somewhat late to the party. They uh, they came in with uh, um, an idea that they described in general terms as northern tools, and no one knew exactly what those were. So over the last several years, we've had the opportunity to sit down primarily with ENR as the lead department, but also with ITI, with the new Department of Lands, and with other interested parties within the government of the Northwest Territories, as well as other Indigenous governments, to help put shape to this. So over the last, uh, I would say, probably 12 to 14 months, Litzulke and the other Indigenous governments involved in the legislative proposal development process that the GNWT has undertaken have worked through a number of the kind of the big issues associated with new protected areas legislation. And we've tried to weave in some of the themes that we've talked about, the importance of government to government, nation to nation relations, the importance of building establishment agreements so that we're not just taking something off the shelf legislatively and trying to apply it to the particular needs and circumstances of a community or region, recognizing the diversity that exists within the Northwest Territories, <coughs> but rather creating protected areas under northern tools that actually reflect northern realities. And so the new legislation has been shaped by these conversations, and we hope that uh, despite the delays that the bill, when introduced, will reflect these conversations and, and create the, uh, the confidence both with this committee but also ultimately with the Indigenous governments that this will be a tool that is better than other tools that exist either in the federal system or in other provincial territorial jurisdictions and can be applied in line with the vision that has driven devolution that this is a partnership between a public government and Indigenous governments when it comes to land management and building economic futures that reflect the needs and realities of their communities. 
So while we are impatient, we are optimistic. And uh, we believe with your committee's assistance, we can, as Litzelke, realize Thai Dene Nene under the territorial legislation in time to take advantage of what is a rare window of opportunity within the federal system to access uh, the Nature Legacy Fund, the $500 million the federal government has put forward to the creation of new protected areas, and the support of Indigenous Guardians programs to staff and sustain those. So as, uh, as a wise man once said, this isn't your father's or grandfather's national park or territorial park. This is truly something new, and it's something that has been built in the north. Thank you, Mr. Innes. Further, Mr. Nakamayak. Yeah, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that, uh, that response and the, your comments. You know, I, I'm a strong believer of um, in traditional indigenous and local knowledge. You know, I, I think that, you know, we, we, we use scientific data, we use algorithms, you know, for computers and all that, but, you know, scientific um, studies can be built on indigenous knowledge, you know, to, to form um, something that, that, that you can get at best accurate data for. Um, and I'm just thinking while you're talking about your conversations about the protected areas, you know, um, I don't know if you've been to Senate committees before where you've sat in front um, uh, of actual committees like that to, to bring this forward and use other arenas. I know we, uh, you have a new Dene National Chief who sits at the Arctic Council. That might be another avenue to bring t awareness to, um, to pressure. I would say maybe Canada and the Northwest Government of Northwest Territories. And also coming up in March is the United Nations Environmental Assembly, the fourth session in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, uh, I think that's probably one of the one of the good arenas to, to take on, where that that will really pressure the governments to work together. You know, you bring it out into the world. It, it, it's amazing what arenas can do. Other angles that can help you get you where you need to go. Sometimes at the beginning, where you see the critical path, um, it doesn't hurt if another two two or three. Um, 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 forums fall into that as long as it gets you to where you need to go. So I think you guys are headed in the right direction. I'm just wondering if, um, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in this next year, um, the next 365 days, you know, we have until March until we can actually make a, an actual eff effect and, you know, within Cabinet and within the GNWT and hopefully, um, you know, it gets more intense and more intense for the right reasons so that you can get to where you need to go. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Nakamaya. We'll take that as a comment. Comment noted. Next, I have Mr. O'Reilly. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. I want to thank you both for coming today. And I've known Stephen for probably 30 years, so I've uh, been out to Little K many times. Um, I think we need to be pretty blunt here today that uh, um, I think our staff are working with you folks uh, really well, from what I hear. Um, the, the problems with uh, our uh, political leaders, quite frankly, are cabinet, who just uh, don't seem to be supportive of conservation economy. And, uh, you know, the latest example, Adege, great announcement. There wasn't even a GNWT representative there. Uh, and it wasn't because they didn't know about it. Uh, they just don't support this stuff, quite frankly. So, um, uh, you know, uh, I think there's some support in this room, but uh, I can't speak for the other MLAs. But um, we have to move our, our cabinet on this. And uh, I really appreciate you guys coming here today to talk to us about this stuff. Two troubling things that I noted in your um, presentation, the slides, and Mr. Uh, my colleague from uh, Cam Lake uh, talked about transportation corridors through territorial parks uh, being one of them. And that, um, we did have, we did meet with, well, I guess one thing I, I, you need to know as well, we don't set the mandate for the GNWT negotiators. Uh, we've never had any input into that. Um, when we did meet with them, I told them that I don't support the idea of transportation corridors through territorial parks. Um, that's just inconsistent with uh, protecting ecological uh, integrity and so on. And that's why the federal government doesn't allow it through national parks. We, we may have different kinds of parks, but clearly transportation corridors through this area are not consistent with its, uh, uh, the objectives and purpose uh, that you folks have laid out. So I, I disagree with our government in, in pushing that, so you, I want that on the record. Um, but the other troubling thing that I noted in here was um, 
that uh, I think it's on your last slide where um, and I'm, I'm not asking you folks to tip any hands here but it looks like the uh, protected areas legislation um, is going to come through and there's going to be a, a set of regulations required for the, the establishment of Phi Dene Nene. Um, I disagree with that approach. I think, and I think it's going to add, potentially add time to getting this, uh, this deal done. Um, I want to encourage you, and I'm certainly going to be pushing it with uh, uh, our folks, that um, as part of that, that uh, bill, there should be a schedule that lays out that Phi Dene Nene is part of the bill. We don't need or want a, an, another regulation that's going to establish this for a couple of reasons. Number one, I think it's going to add extra time. And secondly, if it's done in regulations, that means Cabinet can change the, the, uh, the arrangement at any time, quite frankly. All they have to do is pass another uh, uh, set of regulations or, or delete it. And I, I, that doesn't offer, that, I think, the kind of certainty and protection that, that you folks deserve. So I don't know if you want to comment on the uh, the approach uh, f that the GNWT might or should be taking on the protected areas legislation, but I I'd appreciate your thoughts on that. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. To that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. To that, Mr. Innes. Sure. So I'll, I'll just address perhaps the two issues. First, the uh, the question of access corridors. And you know, we, we, of course, uh, have been at the table um, trying to represent the mandate we've been given, which is to protect Thai Dene Nene. So what we have had to address is a series of largely hypotheticals. You know, what if there is a diamond mine discovered immediately north of McLeod Bay, just on the edge of the territorial park, and there's no other economically viable way of moving uh, material to or from that site. You know, does that mean that that becomes isolated and inaccessible? Uh, we said, well, you know, of course not. We're open to alternatives. Uh, where we've landed is very much one in which any corridor through the territorial protected area has to be a last resort, meaning there is no uh, better option. There's no alternate route of comparable cost or technical feasibility that would be feasible outside of Thud and any. And secondly, that it has to be consistent with the overall management of Thud and any. So if it was to undercut in some fundamental way the values that Thud and any is going to protect, that it would not proceed. And finally, it would be subject to all of the normal rules that apply to uh, any development in the north under the MVRMA regime. It would have to go through a preliminary screening, through an environmental assessment, and finally be determined by the management body for Thai Dene Nene as being consistent with the management of the, of the territorial park. So we think we've built a, uh, a fairly robust, you can do it, but you must be able to jump through all these hoops first set of arrangements that gives us comfort as Lietzel K that these things are unlikely because, you know, in, in all but the most unforeseeable circumstances, alternative routes will exist. So we've found our comfort on that. On the question of uh, how the uh, legislation and the way in which these establishment agreements find their way into legislation, this has been discussed fairly extensively at the technical committees between the indigenous governments and the GNWT, and I don't think we've quite landed on the actual mechanism, but we do have agreement at that level that any change to a territorial protected area once established would require the consent of the participating indigenous governments. So this is where the question of whether it's regulation or a schedule to the legislation becomes very much a question of what is the best path legislatively for the government of the Northwest Territories to make decisions about moving an establishment agreement negotiated between the GNWT and, indig and indigenous parties into law subject to the undertaking which would be written into the legislation 
that any changes would require the consent of that Indigenous government. So with that, we take some comfort that at the end of the day, the GNWT or the Cabinet would not be able to act unilaterally. But we certainly note the concern, and it's something that when we see the text of the legislation and the way in which the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the drafters have, uh, have proposed that uh, these commitments uh, would, be, would be realized in the text, we're going to have probably as many comments as you to make sure that our interests are maintained. Thank you. Further questions, Mr. O'Reilly? Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. I want to thank uh, our two uh, guests for the, the responses. I think that provides a little bit more comfort for me. It doesn't <laughs> deal with some of the issues that we have with uh, our Cabinet colleagues. But um, I do want to provide some assurance that we have been putting significant pressure on uh, our colleagues uh, in Cabinet to move forward with uh, post-devolution legislation. So. Um, it's not over yet. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We'll take that as a comment. Next, I have Mr. McNeely. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks <coughs> to both of you for coming forward and presenting this presentation and more in depth. As you know, your, your uh, presentation is a timing one. We're uh, into the fall session, including. Uh, scheduling of our LP initiatives and I, I, I totally agree with all the elements of the area of conservation particularly when Mr. Nita mentions a con conservation economy when you look at the presentation and, and you listen to you then it really defines what you mean by a conservation economy. And when I look at the, some of the experiences I had in the past, I can see, and I'm all support for meaningful employment. If you look at the uh, biosphere in, in Delaney, how many jobs that has created in a non-industrial community. Now, if you're going to create 18 plus positions in a little community of Litzel K, that, that, that's complimentary. Now, people could afford to buy their children toys and so on and provide a, a healthy environment based on the income they're getting. But I'm also mindful of resource development opportunities. All my life, I, I've worked in an industrial community in Norman Wells and in, in other projects outside that community. So I'm, I'm mindful and, and I respect your decision on leaving that door open through this corridor allowance to back up and support what an elder told me in Good Hope. Development is good but control development's even better. Now, aside from the 18 plus positions you're gonna create in Litzel K, another 18 young adults might come and say, well, fellas, I, I, I don't see myself as, as a conservation officer because I'm more interested in working in an industrial minefield as an equipment operator. So, as leadership, You've allowed for that to tell the young individual to share your initiative and leave the doors open for responsible de development. This is what we've done, looking at the map. So I, I, I'm, <coughs> I'm uh, in total support of, of your, your, your total initiatives on where you're going. And I, and I see the, the, the barriers in front of you. It's our government that is putting, putting the, lo the roadblock. And, and, and I think, uh, I think, and I, I agree with what uh, my Cam Lake member ha has said, you know, it's, it's really not us, it's our government. Sure, we make up our government, but on the decision making forward, it is uh, cabinet that's really uh, at, at the gate. 
for, for allowing this initiative to go ahead and this legislation to go ahead. So my, 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 question, my question to you is, what steps in the planning process have you thought about for the next assembly, assuming it doesn't go ahead this 18th? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. Nito. We're going to run a whole sl slate of people and take out this government. That's the, <laughs> that's the, that's the strategy. <laughs> well, uh, no, uh, Mr. 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 Chairman, uh, thank you for the question, Mr. McNeely. Um, we really haven't given much uh, thought to what we need to deal to do to deal with the next government. Our focus is working with this government and the government that's in Ottawa today. Uh, we want to be able to, to finalize this uh, and create Thaïda uh, Nenea and have those that participated and worked in helping us create that to benefit from that as well. Uh, Mr. McNeely is right uh, that this is a it's going to be a great job creator for Tlisaga and for the region. Uh, the legislation the government, the, the government of Northwest Territories needs to create, also is is being waited upon by other Indigenous governments across the territory. How we view that legislation is to be an enabling legislation, fairly simple, and how that law will be applied will be based on the establishing legal contractual establishment agreements that we negotiate with the government of North East Territories. Those, those establishment agreements will dis determine what can and cannot happen within those protected areas, right across the country, right across the territory. And as m my colleague, Mr. Ennis, indicated, Canada has uh, identified $1.3 billion in this year's budget for for assisting them to reach their Aichi targets to protect 17% uh, of lands, the terrestrial lands and inland waters and 10% of the oceans. The Northwest Territories, as a jurisdiction, can, can provide a lot of leadership in that area for Canada. This protected area, in this area, will give comfort to Tlusaga to work with industry outside of that area. It's creating certainty that their special places are protected and they'll be more open-minded to exploring other economic opportunities outside of that around industrial development and the mineral extraction business. Every community in the Northwest Territories, every Indigenous community in this country has their special places. Not every community has 200,000 square kilometres to create a big protected area like this, but they have their small special places. In the Northwest Territories, the legislation that's been developed can be used through establishing agreements on protecting those special places and creating a certainty for investment outside of those places. That's what this, the promise of that legislation provides. It provides economic opportunities through the conservation economies by protecting the special places and creating investment certainty outside of those protected areas. And Canada uh, has a great deal of money that they can contribute to this process. So it doesn't cost the Northwest Territories government or the taxpayers in the Northwest Territories uh, that much money to engage in this. Thank you for that response, Mr. Nita. Next I have Mr. Bolio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have questions uh, uh, for our guests, but I do have some supporting um, comments on some of the things that um, I just uh, would like to relay to our guests. Um, and as a as a, a group of uh, regular members, uh, uh, we have been pushing uh, legislative agenda, and uh, we have a pretty good feel for uh, protected area legislation uh, that it's going to pass before the end of this government. 
Um, I think that uh, we're going to see um, uh, it go to uh, committee, uh, chaired, um, uh, led by uh, Mr. Van Tyn uh, in in the spring. That's the that is the target, and uh, and and I think there's enough time to do um, the consultation process. I think we we have the full 120 days that would probably be needed to look at this type of legislation through consultation process. But I think there's time, and I think that uh, I think it'll pass in this government. Um, I, I um, I've been on the theme of uh, uh, conservation economy, and uh, and the words that uh, Mr. Nida just used, uh, I I used the same words yesterday in a member statement I made on uh, the Indigenous uh, Guardianship uh, Program, um, where uh, it will give certainty to industry. Uh, that uh, once the area is um, is uh, is protected and, and the parks are put in place and the territorial portions there, GWT portions there, that, and the caribou sanctuary is in place, then everything else outside of that becomes um, uh, a lot uh, certain for industry. As you can see, um, the uh, the two lakes uh, where they're uh, currently uh, have explored uh, diamonds right there are clearly outside, and uh, the other ones are also clearly outside uh, up in, uh, uh, in uh, the uh, Lake Lagra. So um, I've gone to to as um, as a member that represents uh, uh, and um, and. I guess most of the Quechua. Um, I um, I have been uh, uh, also looking at this from all angles, uh, even to a point where community infrastructure would uh, would be involved by asking the uh, government to uh, look at uh, building a new health center in Tlutsalke, which they've agreed to do. So that leaves some infrastructure in the community that's could possibly be used uh, could be used by uh, the park um, and um, and also get the minister to agree on the floor yesterday uh, to work with uh, the indigenous guardianship program along with uh, their own uh, renewable resource uh, officers uh, to uh, again work together uh, to for this uh, towards the um, uh, economy that's going to be created as a result of uh, of the national park and um, with and always keeping in the forefront the uh, the promise uh, of the 17% uh, protected areas across the country made by the current uh, federal government by 2020. So we, we we're seeing those uh, those things happen. This is a big piece of that, and uh, and we don't see anyone uh, uh, putting the brakes on here. I think that uh, it'll go it'll go forward, and that we'll. Uh, I'm, I'm expecting that uh, we are going to get an opportunity to review the review their legislation um, this spring, and uh, it should be passed uh, in the summertime. And so that is uh, um, my my guess on from from you know what I'm doing in here and what I'm what I'm seeing and and the discussions that we're having at our level. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Bolio, for those comments. Comments noted. Um, just um, maybe at this point what we'll do, I don't have anybody in the queue. Any further? Mr. Simpson. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Um, you noted that uh, the feds are going to be putting in $3 million a year and that this trust should generate around $1.5 million a year. I was wondering if you could elaborate on what that money, for those of us not familiar with the national park system and, and the plans moving forward, what will that money be spent on? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Nita. The trust fund will be owned by the First Nations, and the First Nations have committed to be a party to the agreements, the establishment agreement, a partner with Parks Canada and a partner with the Government of North East Territories. And as a party and a partner, we've committed to providing human resources, management, governance, uh, and the forms of uh, guardians and the uh, indigenous guardians. So we're going to have our own staff. Uh, management for that staff will be paying for our our, our uh, appointees to the to the management board. 
uh, and all the equipment and training, uh, insurance, WCB costs associated with having staff that's going to be working alongside Parks Canada and the government of North East Territories. So that's where the, the, the expenditure, the first expenditures legally has got to go to those, those expenditures. If there's money after that, then uh, the Chief and Council can make a decision based on proposals to them uh, from individuals, that, uh, members and non-members, uh, who want to assistance in, in training for tourism development, product development, marketing, et cetera, et cetera, or any organization that can demonstrate a benefit to Thai Thank you. Further, Mr. Simpson? Thank you. And so just for clarity, that will be similar to what the $3 million from Parks Canada is being spent on. Thank, Thank you. you. For clarification, Mr. Nita. The three million for Parks Canada will be what they need to uh, what they need to use to, to fulfill their end of the responsibility in the management and operations and governance of the GNWT. GNWT will have their own costs associated with their staff members and what they're going to invest in, in the management and operations of the GNWT. Right now, they're saying it's two hundred ninety thousand annually for the next three years. Hopefully, uh, that number will grow. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Simpson? Yeah, that, that brings me to the 290,000. I see some big numbers here, and I see that there's a lot of land in the, uh, in the, in the GNWT's portion, the territorial park. And so do you have any estimates of maybe what you think they'll actually need to spend? Because I imagine it's going to be more than 290,000 for three years. It's going to be, you know, it's going to go on forever. And do you have any uh, ideas what the annual expenditure should be? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. To that, Mr. Nita. I may have some ideas. Uh, I think it should be a little bit too, more than 290, but uh, you know, I'll leave the speculation and the questions to you guys. Okay. Thank you. Anything further, Mr. Simpson? Um, sure. You know what? I'm, I'm all in favor of development, but we have a, a big territory. We have a lot of land. We have a lot of resources, and uh, I'm, I'm in support of, of this because this is a, uh, seems like an excellent use of you know, this vast territory. And so uh, I look forward to, the, to, the, uh, to what this is going to bring, not just to, to Little K, but to the whole territory. So I, I wish you all the best. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Comment noted. With that, and in the interest of time, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Nita, for any final comments. Well, thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, the committee, for allowing us the time to present Thaiji Vendina, the story of Thaiji Vendina, and uh, the immediate actions that's required by us and by you guys or by the, by the government of Northwest Territories. We are operating in, in a sensitive timeline. Uh, we we want to operationalize this flight in Indiana before the snow flies next year. And uh, if, we're, if we're going to do that, then we're going to require your, your guys' assistance in and may, maybe not take 120 days to get the consultation of the, uh, the new legislation, and especially given the fact that Indigenous governments have worked with Crown governments in the creation of the, uh, the, li the language that's going to be used in the proposal. Uh, so we ask that the committee, in their role of, of uh, the reviewers of the legislation, uh, to be cognizant of the time pressures that we're under. And uh, we look forward to... Uh, to create Thaigne Minyana in partnership with the government of Northwest Territories, the government of Canada, so that the people of the Northwest Territories can, can, can be proud of uh, what's been created, take ownership of it, and, uh, and brag about it uh, wherever they travel to. With that, Masi Cho. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nita, and thank you for coming and presenting today. Um, Got to thank you for all the effort and work that you've put in to date to uh, establish Thai Denny Nenny. Uh, we've got work to do. Um, for those folks listening and watching at home, um, you know, we in fact uh, have Thai Denny Nenny establishment in the mandate of this 18th Assembly. And so while we've heard a little bit of uh, pessimist, pessimism and, and some optimism, um, I'm hopeful that uh, we can work together in uh, getting Thai Denny Nenny established in the life of this Assembly. So thank you once again. And with that, committee, we can be adjourned. Thank you.